I would like to thank the speaker for their presentation. And let's go to the question that we have from the participant. Uh, first question is actually uh, any work on the team material between the dye and the substrate between the balls? Uh, usually we focus on the between dye to uh, lead side, not the substrate side. But uh, on our experience, we have uh, tried two different uh, cooling system. In the case of the heat sink with a fan, the other one is a cold plate with the water. So on the, this both uh, case, we saw that different both the temperature. That means uh, indirectly we can see some summer dissipation through the, the BJ ball and substrate to go for the bodu. So there's something, but we are still, we don't have any the, uh, uh, idea to, to catch up the only that area summer dissipation value. So we focus on still uh, die and lead size because you know, uh, the, our the, the cooling system trend is a cold plate with water making more the summer performance. So in this case, uh, we saw that uh, very lower uh, board temperature. So that means all the heating flow is a sub through the, the team one to the team two and the cooling, uh, cooling cold plate areas. So, uh, so this is my answer. So I don't have any the collected the value the, between the substrate to die and it, the side. Only board temperature, only different. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is uh, related to the RDL interposer. Also have a stitch area like the Kowos. Hey, yeah, um, thanks for the question. Yes, um, if, if one dimension is larger than about 30 millimeters, uh, we will stitch it. So if the interposer is uh, less than 30 millimeters and less than 55 in the X and Y, you don't need a stitch but many of our, our modules are larger than that, so it does require one stitch. Okay. Uh, regarding the interposing material type, any suggestion for the HBM free speed? Well, I think, you know, that HBM three, uh, you know, I, I've seen several different bus speeds, but we, we think that the, oxynitride in 2.5D interposer is fine all the way up to probably four and a half, something like this. It's, it's dependent on a little bit on the design, of course. Um, so, so that would mean that you should be able to use a silicon interposer. You certainly can use an, an RDL or HDFO type interposer because that's a polyimid dielectric and those dielectric uh, properties are, are better than the oxynitride. Okay, thank you. Uh, sure. Another question coming is actually, what is the advantage of lab assembly for a certain bump pitch? Can, can you repeat the question? What is the advantage of lab assembly for a certain bump pitch? Lab Let's... assembly for a certain bump pitch. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm also not understanding clearly oh. the question. But, uh, it could be LAB may mean laser-assisted bonding for a certain be. bump pitch. Yeah, if that's what the uh, author was intending, you know that that's a local type reflow. Yeah, um, a directed laser to reflow the dye to the substrate as opposed to a bulk heating through an oven, and uh, you know the the most likely product intersections for those are thin or uh, substrates that tend to have real warpage challenges and small copper pillar pitch. If you need to get down below 110 or 100 micron pitch in copper pillar, mass reflow becomes very tough. And so that's where LAB is more advantageous. Okay. Um, 
few other questions that uh, were coming out. Uh, what is the promised team for the high power devices package that the polymer team doesn't work well? Uh, first of all, the current the, uh, the polymer team as a maximum summer conductivity value is uh, around five watt per meter K. So if that one is not workable, that means uh, we need to consider the other one, but uh, still the many suppliers working on to develop higher than five watt per meter K, the polymer team, but still that one is not completed. Also the important one is uh, the die size and the body size will be increased. That means that there's some uh, warpage issue inside. So even the high summer conductivity polymer team working well, but the, with the large body or higher stress inside, maybe making the, the little bit different to the uh, team BRT quality which is not acceptable for the power uh, requirement. So that means uh, maybe I can tell, maybe next one is uh, different to the uh, platform, kind of metal team, uh, Indian base. Also the major, the CPU, GPU, PU, uh, the companies already applied that metal team for their product. So I can tell, Maybe metal team is one of the solution. Okay, thank you. Uh, what uh, well, that question is referring to, Mike? What uh, product category do you see benefiting from the most uh, from the package low level heterogeneous integration? Well, I think certainly things got started on the high end. Um, things. Uh, in the data center, namely, whether it's uh, AI engines or, or processors, that's where heterogeneous got started. And, you know, the low hanging fruit is probably the really uh, complicated uh, RF like high speed 30s IO blocks and, and pulling those out. Um, but I would say there's also another channel that uh, has, has lagged, of course, high performance tends to drive it first. But the other, the other area I would say that is sort of a part of the two forks of interest is small die systems. Perhaps it's a small five or, or it's going to roll to a small three nanometer die and the, the IO blocks just have to be very, very small. So the IO pitch needs to be say, you know, maybe even sub 40 micron pitch. Uh, very simple drivers, very small phys. And uh, that, that tends to lend itself to a different class of products where, you know, cost is, is cost performance ratio is critical and also power is really low. So I would say it's kind of a two forked uh, a set of interest these days from the high end, but Lately, and I would say in the last year, year and a half, especially on low cost, low earth cost combinations of small die, whether that's different silicon nodes or maybe even a mix of RF plus logic kind of thing. Okay, thank you. There's a question, two questions from Ala Alani. Uh, one of them is there any advantages of using lead solar balls in space application? And the second one is what are the advantages of using leaded solar balls in packages used in the space application? So lead solder balls. That's the question, right? Yeah. I, you know, I'm not that familiar with space applications to be truthful with you. Um, uh, you know, honestly, the organics tend to be much more of a concern, right? Because they have a vapor pressure. So, you know, they will actually disappear in space over time. Metal though, I, I, I can't tell you for sure. I, 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 I'd have to defer to the space expert, whoever that is. <laughs> 
Okay, uh, any other of the speakers can answer those two questions from uh, on the space application question from Ala Alani? No, okay. Uh, sorry, Ala Alani, uh, that we didn't <laughs> probably answer your questions. We'll try next year. Uh, now, Rigai, I have two more questions. Uh, one for Brad Griffin. Your presentation uh, seems to mention uh, a lot of different ways to model the package of, on the PCB interconnect. Can you help understand what there are, why there are so many choices and hmm. how can how can actually we can choose one of them? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. <clears throat> the uh, sort of part of the challenge of signal integrity engineering over the years is. You know, how can I get the most accurate results, but also fit within the schedule boundaries that I have? And I think if we all had a choice, we would probably use the most accurate full wave 3D field solver that we could, because that's going to give us the best results. But uh, um, clearly the size of the problem and uh, where you are in the design cycle, these all impact when you would be able to use that most accurate tool. So any engineer, is going to have to find some way to, um, let's just say compromise, I guess, to be able to get results quickly in order to make decisions early on the design cycle to be able to support, um, you know, getting the, the, in this case, we're talking about DDR, get the DDR uh, interface design properly. So I think it's really just a matter of, you know, early on, you're probably gonna rely on either a hybrid solver or quasi-static solvers. Um, but certainly as you get later on in the, de in the design cycle, before you tape out, before you sign off, you'll probably look at using a, a full wave 3D field solver. So I think the reason there's so many is just because every customer has different challenges regarding where they are in the design cycle, what kind of compute resources they have. Um, mm -hmm. So certainly at Cadence, we make a, a, a number of different uh, field solvers available for being able to address those challenges. Okay, there's another question to you. On slide six, on your presentation, you briefly mentioned a true 3D. What is the meaning of this uh, true 3D? What is your actually meaning by that? Yeah, it's. I think it's similar to the previous question because I think when people make that decision that they want to use the full wave 3D field solver, now they're somewhat hampered by what will my compute resource allow me to do? Uh, and traditionally, there's been a process of segmenting up that 3D structure so that they can solve the various different pieces and stitch them together. Um, so at Cadence, we actually would encourage people to rely on the field solver to be more efficient and not have to segment up the design. And so our uh, methodology of doing high, high frequency 3D extraction typically does not require that segmentation. And so, you know, you could, if you're segmenting up the structure, you could miss interaction between uh, the various different pieces. So true 3D, you wouldn't have to worry about that. So that's kind of a term we've, uh, we've coined, I guess, for uh, the fact that our Clarity 3D field solver is much more memory efficient. It can extract larger structures without having to be uh, segmented. Thank you. Uh, another question to uh, Gail, Eddie. The SSN is a uh, synchronous best. Does it, does it mean that we need to balance the SSN clock across the SOC? And uh, another question, how do we control that protein to reduce the test time? Okay, so I'll ask, I'll answer the first question uh, first with respect to balancing the, the clock uh, across the across SOC and uh, the, so the the nodes that are represented in each core has uh, DSQ functionality in them, so uh, DSQ FIFO functionality in them. So you don't have to uh, uh, balance clock skew uh, or, or uh, across the physical regions uh, and and still operate the. Uh, the, uh, this test bus, the SSN bus, as a, uh, at a very high frequency. Um, with respect to, to throttling, uh, so that was the concept we, we talked about where you can uh, basically 
allocate less data to the cores that have fewer patterns and uh, so that all of the cores will, will basically end at, at, the, at the same time. That throttling is, is done automatically. All that the user has to do really is to uh, define some of the kind of higher level constants such as the, the maximum IO shift speed, the maximum core shift uh, frequency, uh, scan enable transition time, et cetera, and everything else, like so how many bits per package is sent to each core is, is handled automatically. Thank you. Is there a way to determine the, the optimal number of the EDT channels to use in a core? Um, yeah, so so the traditionally when you when you plan for uh, uh, for what we call EDT channels or test channels, uh, scan channels for for each core in a design, you have to kind of balance the, the chip level resources with how many uh, cores you're trying to test at the same time um, and and so forth. Uh, with with SSN, the basic idea is that you you just focus on the core by itself. So you look at what would give you the, the highest level uh, of compression uh, per core, and uh, this is really determined by you know by the circuitry of the core itself and and how many scan chains you have. So so the basic idea is that now you can kind of forget about the rest of the design and just look at what would give you the most optimal um, uh, compression for that core in isolation, not having to think about it being used in in different designs that have different amounts of, of chip level test resources. Thank you. Uh, another question is, uh, let's say uh, targeting to the YAD, do you run EDB setting by ANSYS inside the design force for Zuken? Yes, uh, thank you, Ronnie, for the question. So uh, yes, of course, we have um, in Design Force, which is the physical implementation tool, uh, we have interfaces with uh, many different analysis tools. For this, uh, the case of this presentation, we have used ANSYS. And we can export the step, or we can export directly the EDB database with the settings run inside Design Force. Also, with the settings for the um, simplification we need to run on the database. Uh, in a way to avoid to run all those settings on ANSYS side. So you have the ADB database with the settings and just you need to run uh, analysis on at ANSYS side. Okay. Uh, that's um, my question, meaning I'm targeting to Jung. Uh, in his presentation on the, he mentioned the voids on the team. I'm, uh, this is for my personal experience. Currently, with the package that we have in our company, we are in Arbe, we design a radar application, uh, radar RC, and one of our parts is actually a kind of a RCU, radar processing unit, which is a package of uh, flip chip uh, BGA. Uh, and uh, we know we have, let's say, a, po a power consumption of about the maximum with the worst case condition which is six watt. And uh, what is what are the factors, let's say we're using today a heat slug uh, uh, metal uh, on this package, but let's say crossing the one, because we are on a grade two in the automotive, we are very interested not to cross the T junction temperature of the, of the die of one, 125. Now, when you design your uh, team, let's say, and the voids that you mentioned in your presentation, um, what is the best way actually to figure out what is the best design and how you can actually decrease the T-junction uh, case uh, ther thermal resistivity in the design? What are the most factors that actually affecting this from the team material? And if you can go into details about the voids that you describe in the assembly uh, factor, that will be perfect. Um, first of all, I'm focused on assembly side, not the uh, material itself. Okay. Uh, but but uh, sometimes the packing also very important. Initially inside the polymer team has a uh, tiny void with the, uh, the 
uh, not proper the packing. In this case, also has a something issue on mass production. But this is uh, the current uh, our experience. But um, I'm focusing on the, the packaging for the team summer performance design. Uh, first of all, the important one, that one. The, for future, we have a two different approach. One is uh, exposed dye and then direct to attach heat sink on okay. top of the exposed dye. But dye size is uh, the smaller than needed bridge BJ package. So uh, actually the small uh, dye size or total the summer dissipation pass, that one is bottleneck. Even the interconnection very short to the heat sink and cooling system. Uh, second one is uh, we thinking about the mechanical damage issue during the uh, the board mounting, heat sink cottage, something like that. So there is a little bit concern point. Also, the other one is needed uh, bridge BJ, but this one is uh, we need really want to have the uh, high support high thermal performance team. In this case, I can suggest to the polymer team is not work, metal team. So in the case of metal team, this the, uh, the bonding is, uh, we can tell the team soldering mm -hmm. in the case of a metal team. That one is uh, perfectly different from polymer team. That one is a kind of metallic bonding. But in the case of poly polymer team is, uh, uh, just adhesive style, the bonding between the lead and die backside. So actually there's uh, some the contact, different contact resistance value between these two different uh, material and action. So this one is uh, we need to consider with the higher summer stress uh, with the large body or large die size or mojo size. Also second one is to reduce void Still, you know, the we needed the try and error. So that's the reason we have uh, uh, the new team screen uh, steps. So first of all, we need to check the uh, assembly window and then more digging. Also, we want to uh, reduce the PLT, but still there's some void or not proper the interface uh, interface layers between type backside what uh, under the lid, that means also no good. So okay. the, the void issue is uh, not, there is no the, the standard the, uh, design, something like that. This is a material issue or the, uh, not comfortable with the, the, the package uh, design uh, requirement issue. Okay. Thank you. Um, there is a, by the way, I see a question that was already uh, answered by you. Uh, just a minute. Okay. Uh, that's that's the question that I have. I think uh, we, we don't have more questions as I see. Uh, thank you very much. Excuse your... me, Ronnie. Uh, is yeah. it, is, do we still have one or two minutes? Yes, of course. Yes, we uh, have. I just, eight if minutes. I can yes. ask a question to Mike, I uh, uh, was not connected to the right session, so I couldn't really ask the question by the chat. So, okay. first, thank you everybody for your presentation. It was really interesting. So, a question for you, Mike. Uh, did you sure. notice or do you notice a kind of uh, uh, increasing need uh, or usage of those heterogeneous integrations? Or is it just starting in the research field, or is it already used widely? And uh... mm -hmm. uh, yes, definitely, there is there is an, an awful lot of new inquiries. It really started with seven nanometer. Um, you know, AMD had their family of uh, chiplet-based processors out there with Ryzen and Epic, which really show I think kind of led the way for people to see the potentiality for IP reuse because you know that CPU core can be used over and over and over. And I think as 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 people started contemplating moving to five and looking at the wafer costs, and that really drove a serious interest in uh, understanding if there is a way to keep costs lower with heterogeneous integrations of different silicon nodes. 
So, you know, if you can keep something back in 16 and, you know, just move uh, the essential compute functions to five and, um, and then, and then have a, a piece of silicon that's completely reusable for future products. It's a, it's a pretty attractive scenario for both cost and performance, but I think maybe as important or even more important is time to market and total engineering requirement to get every product designed. So definitely seeing a big, a big push for it. It started in seven nanometer, but it seems to be picking up. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm interested sure. in this in this subject because uh, in, in Zuken we are working on the, the EDA side for this heterogeneous uh, integration because there is a lack in terms of EDA to have been designing. It. Yeah, oh yeah. And the EDA is such an essential ingredient for getting that done correctly, right? As yeah. you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Ronnie. Any more questions? Hey, Ronnie, if I, if I could just make a quick comment. <clears throat> yeah. I noticed uh, earlier on when Mike was talking about the um, the interposer materials and different, uh, you know, that what was appropriate for uh, HBM. Um, I just wanted to note that, you know, Cadence certainly has a number of customers that we've worked on with, uh, you know, HBM uh, solutions. Um, we've worked with some of the foundries. There's one of the foundries has a, 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 a I guess, a trademark flow called MDI multi die integration. And there's a reference flow for that. And uh, certainly if you look at that reference flow, you'll find both design, um, thermal and extraction tools, part of that flow. So I think, you know, a simulation and design environment can help you make those decisions as to which uh, materials you should pot potentially be using. So I just wanted to note that the um, the tools and the, the analysis, the design and implement implementation, implementation and analysis tools are out there to help uh, make those uh, engineering decisions. Okay, good one. Thank you. Any more notes, comments from you speakers? No, uh, just one closing comment, if I might, back to uh, Alani on his uh, lead lead bump. So, yeah. you know, I, I, there's just a couple of things I remember. You know, lead bumps are more ductile than lead-free alloys. Yeah. So I'm thinking in space, ultra low temperatures, that might be a consideration, but I know in space, you have to always address the cryogenic super cold environment. And I, I don't know how lead stacks up against other, you know, other alloys. So those would be the things I would, I would go dig out next if I were, if I were looking into that. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the session, for all of you and yeah. the presentation and your uh, comments and answering the questions of the participants. Uh, uh, we were glad to share with, the, share with them. So uh, I hope that we will meet next year. Uh, thank you very much for all of it. Thank you, Ronnie. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.